Amen. Amen and good morning. You know, every since God put His Word into man's hand, they have uh, done everything they could to kind of figure out what's most important, what's most valuable to me as I read it. And you could begin in Genesis and go all the way through to Revelation, and you could find so many great things, so many things that are important, that are valuable. But how do you boil it down? to something that you can walk with every day and know this is what I should be doing, this is what I should be focused on, that can really make the most significant difference in your life. Well, the disciples came to Jesus one day and they asked a question very similar to that. They asked, what's the greatest commandment? In other words, how do we boil this down? How do we make sense out of this? How do we use this every single day? And this is what he said. You find it in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. He said, the main thing to keep in your mind, this is what you need to do every day. Love me with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. And you know, I have found in my own life, no matter what's going on, no matter how many struggles I have to face, no matter how many things I need to overcome, that when I make God, when I make Jesus Christ a priority in my life, when I love him, with everything I have. They just, you know, it does something to you. It takes those, those struggles and those strongholds and it just drops them powerless at your feet. But if I allow those other things to become a priority, if I allow those other things to become more important to me than anything else, then I become overwhelmed by them. And so I encourage you, as you go through this next week and those problems, those struggles those defeats, even those successes begin to pile up. Don't lose sight of the most important thing that we are called to do, and that is love God with everything you've got. Love Him with your heart, your soul, and your mind, and watch the difference in the power that comes over your life through that. Amen? We are going to continue in our series this morning called Choices That Will Determine Your Future. To do what God's created you to do, you're going to need to make some wise choices. Anybody that's here that's had any level of success in your life at all, you know that at some point you made some wise choices. You also know that you've made some really dumb choices too, am I right? I mean, you've made choices that have set you back, that have caused you to struggle. Listen, there are some things in our life that we need to do, choices that we need to make that are going to determine our future. We've already talked about two of those choices. You've got to choose the right values. If you don't choose the right values, you're going to waste your life. You're going to waste your life. You're going to have to choose the right guide or you're going to end up in the wrong destination. We talked about that last week. That guide needs to be the Holy Spirit of God. Today I want to talk about another very important choice that will also greatly determine your future. And that is the people that you surround yourself with. Think about that. You need to choose wisely the people you hang out with. Contrary to what some of you might believe, success is never a one-man show. You could be a solo Olympic athlete, but you still need a team. You have to have a coach. You've got to have a trainer. You've got to have all kinds of other people in your life or success is never going to happen because success is never a one-man show. In fact, remember one of the very first things God said when he created man? You can find this all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. He said it's not good for man to be alone. In other words, we were created for relationships. We were created... You know, for community, we need people in our lives. You cannot fulfill God's purpose for your life without them. I want to start with the four different kinds of people that you're going to need in your life to be all that God wants you to be. You're going to need, for example, because these are, you know, this is a choice that's going to absolutely determine your life. So you're going to need these four people. And these four people are models, mentors, partners, 
and friends. First, you're going to need models in your life. And guys, I'm not talking about runway models. I'm talking about, number one, models who inspire you by their example. On October 1st, 1908, Henry Ford rolled out the very first production car ever made. You know what it was called? The Model T Ford. And guess what? Every car company in the world has used that model to produce the very cars that we're driving today. Think about where you want to be in five years. And let me tell you, you need a model to get there. Even if you intend on surpassing that model, you still need a model to get there. The truth is that we pray and we want every generation to exceed the model that was before them. In fact, we need that more now than ever, don't we? I mean, I absolutely want the next generation to do better than this one did, don't you? But no matter what, you still need a model to get started. Everything you've learned in your life, you've learned by modeling. You've learned how to talk. You've learned how to walk, how to eat. You've learned how to do all of those things by watching other people. You need models in your life. If you don't have a model for where you want to be in five years, trust me when I tell you, you're not going to get there. You need models, but then you also, number two, you need mentors. You need, you need mentors who will coach you. Mentors are your coaches that help you get where you need to go in life. Now, no one person is going to be able to mentor you in every area, so you're going to need lots of different kinds of mentors. And I'll be honest, in my life, I've had three really, really good mentors, and each one of those brought something new and distinctive to my life. And they all taught me something very different. My first mentor that I ever had was my stepfather. He taught me a lot about hard work. He taught me how important it was to never give up and to always finish what you start. That was early on in my life. And you understand that still influences me today. I mean, as a young man, I can still hear my father, you know, speaking in my ear, son, if you're going to start something, you're going to finish it. And there were many times he made me finish things I started, even if I didn't want to. I had different mentors all along the way. There was a, a friend of mine, his name's Joe Hernandez. He was a mentor to me, and he taught me how to deal with organization. He taught me how to deal with management, how to lead. He taught me how to think strategically. Then there was Pastor Clark. He was by far the mentor who inf influenced me the most spiritually. He taught me how to preach. He taught me how to pray. He taught me how to trust God for things I could never imagine as well as a lot of, of other things that I'm still benefiting from today. So you need models and you need mentors in your life. And then number three, you need partners. You need partners who will share that dream and work with you. Partners, you know, are the people who actually work with you on your dream. Listen, it could be your career. It could be your vision. It could be some kind of cause or a purpose. It's something that you say I really want to do this with my life. And you need some other people who share that dream. You need some other people who will work with you to make that a reality. Those are your partners. We could have never seen God do the work that he has done around here in our school and our church and all of our other ministries without some really good committed partners. So you need models and you need mentors and you need partners and then finally, you need friends who love and pray for you. Now, your friends may not share your dream with you. They may not even, you know, want to be a part of the, the work that you're involved in. They're just good friends. They're the people who walk in your life when everybody else is walking out. Everybody needs friends. Now, you don't need a lot of friends in your life, you know, contrary to popular opinion. In fact, my Facebook right now, I looked this morning, says I have 946 friends. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have not met most of those people, but they say that we are friends. The truth is you only need three or four really, really good friends. Because good friends bring out the best in your life. Your best friends should make you your best. If your friends are not building you up, all they're ever doing is tearing you down, 
that can I be honest with you this morning? They are not your friends. You want to have people around you who lift you up. I mean, think about it. If I'm standing out here on the edge of this stage, you think it's easier for me to pull you up or is it easier for you to pull me down? Well, it's obviously easier for you to pull me down, right? Now, I'm talking about surrounding yourself with people who will stand by and, and, and really encourage you to be who God's called you to be, but not necessarily stand by and watch you destroy yourself. That's not a friend either. Real friends, listen to me, real friends are truth tellers. Real friends are, listen, they're the ones who will make you matter than anybody else in your life and still go out to dinner with you. You need those truth tellers in your life. They're the kind of people that, that when you tell them the truth, you know, they're still going to want to be a part of your life. You know how many times over the 21 years that I've been here that I've looked in people's eyes and I just want to absolutely lie to them? I'm telling you the truth. You know why? Because I knew what was next. I knew the moment I told them the truth that it was going to be the last time that I saw them. And yet everything inside of me says, I have to be that person that tells the truth no matter what. And that's not always easy to be that person. I've watched hundreds of people over the years in this church leave and never come back because I couldn't do anything but tell them the truth. But you need those people in your life if you want to be who God's called you to be. Proverbs 18.24 says, there are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Listen, you may already know what God wants you to do with your life, but you will absolutely miss it if you choose the wrong friends. Because the right friends, they're always going to be pushing you in the right direction, and the wrong friends, they're always going to be pulling you in the wrong direction. So you need models and mentors and friends. And there are people who are going to be your personal support group. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, we work together as partners, I love this, as partners who belong to God. Man, I was in a meeting the other night in, in St. Charles, and we had hundreds and hundreds of people at a meeting talking about starting a new school. And the most exciting part of this meeting was how many Christian people were there. How many people came up to me afterwards and said, hey, we're praying for you. We're praying that God would work all the details out that needs to happen to start a school here. There's nothing that's more encouraging than that to know that you have people that, that are surrendered to God, that are in partnership with you to accomplish God's purpose. Notice the word partner because I want to focus on this third group of people and how you build a team of partners. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to run fast, run by yourself. But if you want to run far, run with other people. I told you as we were closing out 2020 that I really want to see every person here succeed in your life. A lot of people are nothing more than a flash in the pan. I mean, they fly high with Jesus for a short season of their lives, you know, and then they just kind of come back down and they kind of just drift away. I really want to help you finish your life well. I really want to see the life that you live be well lived. And when the time comes for your life to end, I want to see it end well. But you know the truth is for some of you, and this is the truth teller in me, so if you get mad and you don't come back next week, I completely understand it. The truth is for some of you, that's not going to happen. Your life is not going to end well. In fact, if I can just be honest with you, five years from now, some of you are going to be off the road of life in a ditch somewhere. You're going to detour your life. You won't even be going to church in five years. Let me tell you why. First, you never intended for that to happen in the first place. You weren't ever serious about God's plan for your life. You kind of wanted it maybe just a little bit but you didn't want it more than anything else in your life. And if you don't want Jesus more than anything else in your life, that half-hearted attitude is going to get you spit out of his mouth. I know that's crude, but that's what he said to us. 
you got to want Him more than anything else. But too many, you want to do things your own way on your own terms. You want to have fun. You weren't fully committed to God's purpose for your life. The second reason is you never built a team. Listen, if you don't build a team, when times get tough, you're going to get discouraged. You're going to flame out. You're going to pull over and you're going to park. What I'm talking to you about today is so important to the rest of your life and will absolutely determine your future. Some of you may ask, Pastor Randy, why do I need the team of people in my life? Why can't I just do my dream by myself? Well, let me just tell you, if you have a dream that you can fulfill by yourself, it's not big enough to be from God. Because God's dream for your life is going to be so far bigger than anything you could ever dream on your own. And it will absolutely require, it'll require having people in your life to be fulfilled. God's vision will be so big, it will always be involving other people. The Bible teaches us that we need a team in our lives for five reasons. And the first reason is the most obvious. And that is, number one, to make up for our own weaknesses. Nobody, and I mean nobody, has all the talent. Nobody has all the knowledge. Nobody has all the time. Nobody has all the strengths. Nobody has all the resources. And nobody, no matter what what your dad or your mom or somebody else may think, nobody has all the answers. We all have weaknesses. And you know the truth is? God has intentionally made us that way. We're all gifted differently. We all have different talents and abilities because God made us that way. He made us that way so that we would need each other to get the job done. As I said, as I said if you can do your dream by yourself, it isn't big enough to be a dream from God. Paul said in Romans 1.12, I want us to help each other with the faith that we have. In other words, your faith is going to help me and my faith is going to help you. I need a team, but just, not just to compensate for my weaknesses. I need a team, number two, to bring out the very best in me. There's no doubt, at least in my humble opinion, that Tom Brady, best quarterback in history. In my humble opinion, Michael Jordan, best basketball player in history. But all of those guys that you can think of, absolutely needed a team to bring out the best. They needed coaches. They needed trainers. They needed encouragers to come alongside of them. Every pro athlete needs a coach and a team of people around them to get the best out of them, no matter how great they are. And you and I need people in our lives who bring the best out of us. That's what I love so much about our school, about our discipleship classes, because when you can get together and people can be there to encourage you, that's what brings the best out of you. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. That's what you want to look for in your friends. Do they sharpen me? I mean, am I, allow, am I allowed you know, to sharpen them? If they don't sharpen you, they're not your friends, and if you're not sharpening them... You're not really their friends. You're just acquaintances. You should only have as your closest friends people who sharpen you, people who, who make you better, people who help you become you know, what you're supposed to be, people who bring out the best in you and allow you to do the same in their lives. Then you need a team of people in your life, number three, to get more work done. Ecclesiastes 4.9 says two people are better than one because they can accomplish more by working together. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? So you need other people in your life to get more done. Another reason I need a team, you know, in my life is number four, to help us get back up when we stumble. You may have God's dream for your life, but that doesn't mean that you're going to get there without a fight. Everything I've ever tried to accomplish for God there's always been a fight. You guys know I'm working on trying to start schools. I've tried to keep my head as low as I can possibly keep it because I know the fight is coming. You're never going to attempt anything for God without a fight. You want to have a good marriage? There's going to be a fight on your hands. You want to raise good kids today? You're not going to be able to do that without a fight. 
And if you give up, if you're not willing to fight, then you're going to lose everything you've got. Everything that God calls us to is going to come with a price. You're going to have to be willing to battle. You're going to have a battle. And in the process, you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you're going to fall and you're going to stumble. The Bible says in James 3, 2, we all stumble in many ways. Folks, that's all of us. And if you don't have a team to help you get back up when you fall, you're going to end up in a ditch somewhere and you're going to be stuck there the rest of your life. And some of you are there right now. It's so hard to trust people today, isn't it? I mean, you don't want to be vulnerable to someone. You don't want someone to to come into your life and, and, and really get real personal with you. And so what we do is when we fall, we just stay there because we don't trust there's anybody out there that truly cares enough about us to help us. The Bible says in James, we all stumble in many ways. Man, that's all of us. You need that life alert. You remember that life alert that says, help, I've fallen and I can't get up? Listen, that's what a team is. It's a life alert to one another, and it's the Holy Spirit of God who is our monitoring system. He tells us, hey, your brother or your sister has fallen, and they need you to help them to get up. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4.10, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But listen to this. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. You're in real trouble because there's no one to help you. So you need a team around your life to to make up for your weaknesses, to bring out the very best in you, to get more done, to help you get back up when you stumble and fall. And then you're really going to need a team in your life, number five, to resist the attacks and criticism. Listen, I already told you, the moment you choose to follow God's dream for your life, there's going to be somebody who's hating on you. Somebody who's, who's going to, to, to just really do everything they can to tear you down. Somebody who's not going to like it. In fact, the moment you hang out that shingle with your name on it, somebody's going to start throwing rocks at it. No matter who you are in life, you're going to be criticized by somebody. You're going to be talked about. You're going to be lied about. You're going to be lied to. It's going to happen, so you've got to decide... Who is it? And I made this decision a long time ago because I've been lied to, I've been lied about, I've been criticized. But I made a decision a long time ago. Who is it that I want to be criticized by? See, you get the choice. Who are the people that I want to be talking about me? Who are the people that I want to be lying about me and lying to me? Well, I personally want to be criticized by those small-minded thinkers. I mean, if people are going to criticize me and talk about me and lie about me and lie to me, I want them to be people who do not understand the kingdom of God. You hear what I'm telling you? I want to hang out with people who understand that people matter to God, that Jesus Christ is the only way to a right relationship with God. I want to hang out with people, you know, who are big thinkers, risk takers, dreamers, visionaries, people who aren't afraid to trust God. Man, those are the people whose opinion really matters to me. Those are the ones that I really want to be a partner with. Folks, you think that our young people today really need to understand that? And they get so caught up in what everybody thinks about them. You can't care about everybody's opinion. You're never going to please everybody. Listen, you can't please yourself most of the time. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, By yourself, you're unprotected. An enemy can attack and defeat you, but two can stand back to back and resist, and a team of three is even better. Like a triple braided rope, which does not break easily. Listen, the more strands you have in a rope... Obviously, the tighter it's going to be. The more people you have on your team, the stronger your team's going to be. And you're going to be less likely to cave under attack. But folks, when you're by yourself and you get criticized, when you get talked about, when you get lied about and lied to, when somebody attacks what you're doing, you know what happens? I see it all the time. You get your feelings hurt. You get offended. You get discouraged. And you're, you're a whole lot more likely just to quit, just to give up. 
you don't have the right team around you, the Bible says you're in real trouble. The Bible teaches us that there's at least four things that we need to look for in the people that we keep the closest to us. As you start building this team for your life, let's just call it maybe your dream team. When you start building this dream team, the first thing that you need to choose is, number one, people who genuinely want to love God and serve Him. Man, that's the bottom line right there, isn't it? I mean, you want to make sure that the people you choose, the people who are going to be closest to you, are people who genuinely love and serve God. Because listen, if the people you choose to be closest to you, if they don't love God and they have no interest or desire to serve God, you're not going to be going in the right direction for very long. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 6.14, don't become partners, don't team up with those who reject God. I love the message paraphrase of this. He's talking about unbelievers. And he said, you shouldn't have a partnership with an unbeliever. He says, don't become partners with those who reject God. He asked the question, how can you make a partnership out of right and wrong? He goes on to say, that's not a partnership. You know what he says it is? He says, that's a war. That's going to be a real problem for you. Then he asked the question, can light be friends with darkness? How can Christ and Satan agree with anything? You've got to choose people who want to love and serve God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, and as Christians, I'm sure if you've been here, I've, I've said this so many times, but I don't think you really believe it. And so I hope when you hear it today, you allow your heart to be open just a little bit wider and get it out of your head and into your heart because this is so real. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, do not be misled. He's talking to Christian people. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Now, let me give you a word of warning here. You are not strong enough, no matter what you think about yourself, you are not strong enough to be the exception to this truth. Bad company always corrupts good character. I've seen really good people. I mean, good people that I had great fellowship with. I've seen really good people who started hanging out with people who lived their lives. I mean, they lived their lives to gossip about other people. And you know what happens? They suddenly, these really good people, they suddenly become the worst lying storytellers in the church. I've seen really good, strong, faithful Christians who start hanging out with people who have no real desire for God and they suddenly become unreliable. People who can no longer be counted on. Listen, you can have good dreams and you can have good character, but if you choose the wrong team, you're going to find yourself corrupted and going in the wrong direction. So the first thing you've got to do is choose people who love and serve the Lord. And then you want to number two, choose people who are committed to growing in character. You don't want to surround yourself with people who think they've arrived and there's nothing left for the Lord to do in their life. People who think God's really lucky that, that he has them on his team. You want to surround yourself with people who know and are interested in growing and developing their godly character. Truth is, your talent is only going to take you so far, but your character, that's going to take you all the way to the end of your life. There's a lot of talented people in this world who flame out, who end up in the ditch somewhere, who never make it to the finish line in life. You need people in your life who will help you grow in integrity, in humility, and in generosity, because these are the things that affect your character the most. For example, if you want God to bless your dream, you got to live with integrity. Proverbs 10, 9 says, People with integrity, listen to this, have a firm footing, but those who follow crooked paths will slip and fall. Integrity is not just about honesty. It's about keeping your focus. It's about not getting distracted from you know, what God's called you to do. Listen, the world we're living in 
and, and many of the people that, that surround you right now, they are going to constantly be offering you opportunities to do anything other than what God has called you to do. I've had so many people, they've always got a list of things that I ought to be doing that has nothing to do with what God's called me to do. And there's always going to be people like that in your life that's always got something else for you to do other than what God's called you to do. And you've got to know what you've been called to do with your life, and then you have to have the integrity to follow through to that to the end, no matter what. Another thing that will help you grow and develop your character is humility. Again, the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 34, God has no use for conceited people. In other words, God hates arrogance and pride. God has no use for conceited people, but He shows favor to those who are humble. If you want God's favor on your life, if you want rock-solid character, then you need to walk in humility. Now, it's not... I think it's important to understand that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just simply thinking less about yourself as often as, as you do everything else in life. In other words, if you just think of yourself a little bit less often, you know, you're going to find yourself walking in the humility that God's called you to. Great people make other people feel great. Another thing that will help you grow and develop your character is generosity. Did you know that selfishness and self-centeredness is the single greatest destroyer of a person's character? Proverbs 22.9 says, Generous people will be blessed. There are more promises in the Bible about generosity than any other promise. You need to become a generous person and you need to surround yourself with a team of generous people. And I'm not talking about your money. I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your, 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 your attention, your compliments, your praise, your affirmation. I'm talking about being generous in every area of your life. Be willing to help other people. You want to be godly, and you want the people around you to be godly. Psalm 92, 12 and 14 says that godly people will grow and flourish like palm trees, even in old age, they will still bear fruit, and they'll stay fresh and green. Folks, this is what I want for all of us. I want us to grow and flourish the rest of our lives. So you got to choose people who love and serve the Lord, and you've got to choose people who are committed to growing in character. And then you got to choose people, number three, who do what's right even when it's hard. And we know in our world today, that's hard to find those kind of people. You need people in your life who will support you, you know, when you're not afraid to do the right thing, whether it's at work or school or anywhere you go. You want people in your life who themselves will do what's right, who will do what's godly, even when it's hard. If you want God's blessing on your life, this is a prerequisite. Last one. You've got to choose people who love and serve the Lord. You've got to choose people who are committed to growing in character. You've got to choose people who will do what's right, even when it's hard. And then finally, number four, you've got to choose people who will take bold risks in faith. God has a plan and purpose for your life, just like He had for all of those great heroes of the faith that we read about in, in, in God's Word. God's purpose for your life Listen, it is as important as His purpose was for their lives. But to do it, you're going to have to take some bold risks of faith. Notice what the Bible says in Acts 15, 26. Along with Paul and Barnabas, we're sending some men who have risked their lives for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, my prayer that is our church will be filled with men filled with men who will risk their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, filled with women who will risk their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, filled with students that will risk their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because listen, it's the only thing you know, worth risking your life for. The problem we have today is that we are now in a culture where we're giving first-class allegiance to second-class causes all the time. And those causes have betrayed us. I mean, think about materialism, self-indulgence, secularism. Listen, those things don't work. They're dead ends that lead to emptiness. Today, we have 
We have so many people that, that are climbing the ladder of success, and when they get to the top, they realize too late that they've leaned their ladder against the wrong wall. You need to take risks, but you need to take risks that are for the glory of God, that are for God's purpose and plan for your life. If you're going to fulfill the purpose that God made you for, one thing you're going to have to do is stop being what everybody else wants you to be. Amen. Listen, God made you to be you, and you've got to be okay with that. If you're going to be what God wants you to be at some point, you're going to have to stop apologizing for being a Christian. You're going to have to be okay with being you. You've got to be able to say, hey, world, this is me, and I'm okay with that. I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to stop being ashamed of being a Christian. Listen, everybody else is coming out of the closet. Why don't some of you Christians come out as well? I mean, think about this. Everybody else in society is saying, I am a this. I am a this. I am a this. You ever notice that it's only Christians who have that Arctic River disease? You know what the Arctic River disease is? Frozen at the mouth. You know, we're the only ones that, that, that are ashamed to tell people who we are. You've got to stop being what other people think you ought to be. You cannot fulfill God's dream for your life without saying, this is me, world. Like it or not, this is who I am. I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm not ashamed of it. As your pastor, I'm asking you, don't waste one more day of your life on petty decisions. I mean, things that aren't going to last, that aren't going to matter in five years, much less eternity, don't waste your life. I have every intention of finishing well, and I want you to finish well. That means you've got to stop caring what all those people who are going in the wrong direction think about you. You've got to stop letting them determine your life. Man, our children, our children deserve, they don't just need, they deserve you to be that example for them. One of my favorite life verses is Acts chapter 13, 36, and it says this, David served God's purpose in his generation, and then he died. Man, I'm so jealous of Pastor Clark. We grieved the loss of Pastor Clark last week. I'm still so jealous of him, though. He preached on Thursday, and he died on Friday. Think about that. He preached on Thursday. You know what he did on Friday? He got up and he had breakfast with his wife. He had devotion with his wife. He prayed with his, his wife. And a few hours later, he died. It's like, dang, man, that's how I want to end my life. I mean, I'm serious. I'm so jealous of that. Think about this. I can't think of a more defining statement that I once said about my life. Pastor Randy served God's purpose in his generation, and then he died. Listen, David served God's purpose in his generation. You understand? You cannot serve God in somebody else's generation. You either do it now or you forget about it. I think I've done more funerals in the past seven years than I have the past 23 years combined. Folks, the time for half-hearted, you know, saints, this half-heartedness, it's got to be over with. Either this generation will step up and say, the rest of my life is going to be the, the best of my life, or we can just go ahead and kick the can down the road and hope somebody else picks it up. But as your pastor, i got to tell you, I'm not wired that way, and I'm not interested in doing that. This is our job, and we must do it. So I'm asking you to please stop wasting your time. Stop wasting your money. Stop wasting your effort and your talent. Stop wasting your life and just say, God, I'm all in. Whatever that looks like, whatever that means, I'm all in. 2 Chronicles 16.9, I want to wrap up with this. It says this, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those, listen to this, whose hearts 
are perfected by Him. You don't have to be perfect to be used by God, but you do have to have a perfect heart. That means that it's turned toward God. You don't have to be sinless, but you do have to have your heart turned in the right direction. And you have to say, God, I'm all in. I want you to use me. And then, when you say that, then be prepared for God to blow your mind. Man, when you make yourself available to God and you say, I'm all in and God, I want you to use me, you need to be prepared for God to blow your mind because He'll do things in and through your life you couldn't even imagine on your own. 1 John 5, 4 says, Every child of God can defeat the world. Every child of God can defeat the world. And our faith is what gives us this victory. No one can defeat the world without having faith in Jesus as the Son of God. Folks, all this starts with choosing the right team and then telling God, no more messing around. The rest of my life is going to be the best of my life. Telling God, I am all yours. Do with me as you please. Amen? All right, would you stand with me as we close this morning? God, I thank you so much for those that are here, and I pray that, Lord, their hearts were open to receive your word, and God, that your word found fertile soil, Lord, and that it would begin to, to produce a crop a hundredfold, that your church would stand prepared and ready to do battle for all the things that you've called us to do, that we'd stop standing on the sideline and, Lord, watching as the world just constantly takes advantage of your people. Help us to open our mouths and confess our loyalty to you, God. Help us to no longer be ashamed to be called your children, to be called Christians. God, I pray right now that as we stand in your presence with our head bowed and, and our eyes closed, that you would begin to block out all the other distractions and that you would have your way in us. I'm going to ask our counselors to come and with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. This is your moment of decision. It starts with a choice to build a dream team. So can you just pray this prayer in your heart? God, I'm all in. I don't want to waste my life any longer by trying to please people who don't even care about you. I'm all in. Can you tell God this morning, Lord, I want to please you. I want your favor. I want to live my life with integrity, with humility, with generosity. I want to surround my life with people who are committed to doing the right thing, even if it's hard. Maybe you can say to God this morning, I don't want to get caught up in being critical and complaining all the time. I want to be positive in the face of criticism. I want to live a life, Lord, that, that people will see as a holy example and serve you. Can you tell God, I want to be a part of this church. I want you to use my life. Ask him to give you the right team. Can you tell God, Lord, right now, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, can you just pray, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Be my Lord. Take over every area. Ask him to accept you into his family. As you have the opportunity before God this morning, would you come? Our counselors would love an opportunity to pray with you. We're going to extend this opportunity a little longer.